and welcome back. We have been joined on set, as we mentioned, prior to our first commercial break. We do have with us in studio this morning, Honorable Francis Fonseca. He is the Minister of Education, Sports, Culture and Technology. Not sports, yeah. Uh, Minister of Science. <laughs> Culture, Culture, Science, and technology. and technology. I always get caught up with that little <laughs> distinction. Yeah. Good morning, Good Minister. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, a pleasure to, to be with you this morning. It's uh, been a while since we've had you on our set. And true. so uh, there's a lot for us to discuss this morning. We're going to be sure. talking a bit about the education system. We're going to be talking about the impact of LISA. And of course, anything else that falls within the ambit of your responsibility. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Let's begin by talking, first of all, about the impact of Hurricane Lisa on schools. It's the most recent <laughs> event that has happened in terms of the overall scheme. And there was some controversy mm -hmm. in the wake of Hurricane Lisa from the union. But we're not going to focus on the union at this point. Let's begin by talking about what you guys found post-Lisa in terms of some of the schools that were used as shelters that also sustained uh, physical or structural damages. Let's start there. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, Hurricane Lisa was, you know, had a devastating impact on the Belize district. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly saw it firsthand <coughs> in the Freetown constituency that I represent. Um, you know, devastating impact on families, on, on, on students, and on teachers. Um, as you rightly said, it impacted uh, educational institutions, uh, primarily in Belize District, but also a few in, in the Cayo District as well. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I, I know everyone appreciates is that schools um, are used as hurricane shelters. Yeah. Um, so you know, we have to look at it at different, from different angles as well. So that was a, a disruption that we, we really did not want for yeah. our schools, especially coming on the heels of, of COVID, where our students have been out of the classroom for, for two years. But immediately uh, in the aftermath of the hurricane, as um, soon as the all clear was given, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Ministry of Education, we hit the ground running um, to work along with both uh, NEMO, Ministry of Human Development, and the Ministry of Infrastructure Development and Housing um, to carry out a comprehensive assessment of the state of our schools mm -hmm. and the impact that the hurricane had had on our schools. And that assessment found um, that 77 schools had been damaged mm -hmm. um, at varying levels. Um, so you had some where you had significant damage, obviously, some, you know, um, medium levels of damage, and then some with very limited damage where you had a window broken mm -hmm. or a door damage or flooding. Um, so that's what we found. One of, for example, one of the, the worst cases uh, was the Belize Rural Primary School in Doublehead Cabbage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, here in Belize City, we had St. Luke Methodist which also suffered significant damage as well. Um, a lot of it had to do with roof, roof damage. Um, so that, that was the case with, with schools. 77 schools suffered damage. We also um, did a survey of our teachers yeah. to find out the, the impact on them. And we found that um, 80 teachers um, in the Belize district, this is all now, primarily Belize District and also, mm -hmm. as I said, Cayo, mm -hmm. where there was some limited impact as well. Um, and we found that um, 80 teachers suffered damage, varying levels. I think three, fortunately, um, well, unfortunate for them, but fortunate in the wider scheme of things that only three teachers uh, lost their homes, but yeah. un very unfortunate. Uh, it could have been worse. Um, so three teachers lost their homes and then there were, you know, I think a dozen or so who lost their roof. Mm -hmm. um, and then others suffered varying levels of damage to their homes. Um, so we were not only focused on school infrastructure, right. but we were also trying to find out, um, working along with the National Teachers Union, working along with our managements, um, what impact this had had on our teachers. 
um, of course we know that students and their families have been affected as well so most of that damage in terms of teachers most of that was in Belize district I think only three cases were in the Cayo district where teachers got damage um, we sent out a survey and then we sent out teams on the ground um, so that work has been done um, we have put together a, a, a comprehensive report mm -hmm. which forms a part of the wider the bigger the larger uh, NEMO assessment report mm -hmm. um, which we then submit to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and forms upon the office of the Prime Minister which then forms a part of our efforts um, to, f to access the financing needed to, to repair um, and rehabilitate let me the ask schools. A let me ask a quick um, question here. Okay, Minister, so you've laid out for us mm -hmm. the process that it will take in terms of accessing the finance necessary to rehabilitate some of these structures. What happens in the interim? Yeah, yeah. Because students need to get back to school, uh, teachers mm -hmm. need to go on with their lives. What happens in, in that intervening time? Yeah, no, no. I mean, the fortunate thing is that all of these schools are are operational um, mm -hmm. even in the case of Belize Rural Primary High School in Doublehead which as I said suffered the most significant mm -hmm. damage uh, they have temporarily moved classes into the community center it's mm -hmm. not the ideal situation of course um, but schools have not been interrupted mm -hmm. and that's critically important mm -hmm. um, but th yeah the, the, f the final point I was going to make was mm -hmm. that we're not waiting on on those funds to, to come in yeah we've also worked with many other partners um, we're working it's, I'm very happy to report that the private sector has, has reached out mm -hmm. I know uh, for example the central bank has made a contribution to, to the ministry um, Boeing and Boeing um, we reached out to the utilities as well mm -hmm. um, our other partners UNESCO um, you know all of UNICEF these um, UNICEF really um, they've all come on board um, so we're accessing financing to carry out you know repairs as we speak um, trying to address those repairs um, but as you know um, you know even before the hurricane um, you know a lot of our school infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, was in need of rehabilitation um, it's an ongoing challenge um, we have over 600 schools in our country um, and I can tell you that you know every week we get requests for support um you know for for, for rehabilitation and, and, and what was the um if you can if you can speak to us about the the miscommunication that occurred with the ministry and bntu and i will say miscommunication because um at the end of the day uh, schools are operating people are moving on with with the education mm -hmm. um curriculum and so forth and as we understand it uh it wasn't a, a halt on education or it wasn't a, a, a teachers wanting a holiday it was that we want to work together and so forth so in in the grand scheme of of things um schools are operational as you mentioned mm -hmm. uh so what exactly was the miscommunication that happened yeah i don't know that um there was any miscommunication mm -hmm. um, there may have been a misunderstanding okay and I think these things you know can happen in the in the context of of that type of discussion that we had um, mm -hmm. this was um, I was on the ground mm -hmm. we had a this is a what's up <laughs> mm -hmm. what's up discussion that we had um, it's not a formal meeting, meeting. sitting down okay so um, you know, and I, I, let me say at the outset that, you know, I have, I believe, enjoyed a, a very good, respectful working relationship with the BNTU. I have mm -hmm. the greatest respect for our teachers across the country. Mm -hmm. um, and I have great respect for the leaders of the BNTU. I think everyone is operating in good faith. I think we have, we share common objectives about mm -hmm. improving the quality of our education system. Um, so I think we have a, a, a common objective. Mm -hmm. um, I think that meeting, um, as I said, I was on the ground. I was actually in Belama uh, on the ground and I, I pulled, uh, I stepped on a tree to, to have this discussion with um, the president um, and two other members of the executive. Mm -hmm. And I think um, 
I certainly know that I made it very clear both at the beginning of that discussion and at the end of that discussion um, that we could not close schools. Mm -hmm. We would not close schools. Um, I think what um, since the BNTU was saying was, um, you know, teachers have been affected mm -hmm. and, and, and students have been affected. Uh, that first week from the 7th until the 14th, um, we should not have we should not have classes in the Belize district. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there was some perhaps miscommunication, misunderstanding. Um, so, you know, I, I think I, I chalk it up to that. Um, it's not nothing more than that. Um, the important thing is that, um, you know, we have addressed all of the concerns that the BNTU raised in that discussion. Uh, we made sure that we reached out to teachers to find out what impact the hurricane had had on them. Uh, we did a very quick, early, urgent assessment of the state of our schools. Um, you know, we engaged with um, ensuring that counseling, this was an issue that they raised with me right. during that discussion, mental health, mental mm -hmm. wellness mm -hmm. counseling was available uh, to our teachers and students. Uh, we've tried to put that in place as well. Uh, and we did. We said, listen, that first week was a transition period uh, we would not close schools um, but obviously um, if any teachers had been affected if any schools had been damaged they could apply for additional time and that's exactly what happened mm -hmm. um, many schools applied for an extra week um, some needed only three days they knew best what they needed um, so I think it all worked out very well so it's essentially on a school by school right. basis is, the degree of damages that they had to deal with exactly exactly and they applied this on a on a platform that was provided by the ministry of education right yeah okay so w when and, and just kind of segueing right into um into the ministry of education and and these platforms in, in uh -huh. general um data for curriculum and then the next step since the curriculum framework was was launched, launched yeah. um can you provide us uh, an update on what you're seeing so far yeah well we've just entered the the second phase as you rightly said mm -hmm. we launched the national curriculum framework um i think sometime in august yes. um and we've had i think um 171 primary schools have uh are now using that new curriculum, mm -hmm. um, which is excellent, excellent. Um, 171 schools um, in the rural, I think we have about 50 in Belize in, in, in urban areas and, and the rest are rural schools because we wanted that uh, experience and, and, and to be able to gain not, uh, data from, mm -hmm. from both urban schools and rural schools. Um, we've entered the phase now of, of monitoring and support uh, providing so that's where we are now um, we're now engaging about to start an, a new phase of consultations so the team that we had put in place led by uh, minister zabane dr mm -hmm. zabane uh, will engage again will visit all the districts um, and engage with with with, with these schools um, and then you know we also have um, you know this whole support team that we put in place as well a technical team a support team um, that will meet with teachers uh, meet with specific schools teachers and meet with students um, and based on that we will then be able to provide a, a, a proper report on how it's going so far um, it's only been a, f a few months yeah a few months um, but we're very pleased with um, the initial, if you like, the preliminary reports that we've gotten. Um, I think students are embracing the new curriculum. Teachers are embracing. It's, it's never easy to, of course, as you will appreciate, um, you know, to start something new, uh, especially when you're talking about curriculum reform. Uh, that's a major undertaking. So we know there are many challenges that our teachers experience. What is um, the, the um, ministry's uh, overall objective for, for results? I, I, would, I would like to think this is a pilot. It is a pilot. Um, yeah. Curriculum. And so w when do you believe that you would start to um, 
to dissect the results of this of this particular curriculum, particularly for primary school where you are not necessarily going to see your best results at you know standard five or standard six. You're going to probably see those results in high school. Right, right. So what what would be the objective for those results? Yeah, the objective is this monitoring and mm. support phase will last about six weeks, about six weeks, and then immediately thereafter um, we will then analyze that data that we've collected um, and move to in move to the next phase really which in is, is is full um, application of the new curriculum we have said that we want all our primary schools um, and of course secondary schools as well mm -hmm. in august of 2023 um, to adopt this new curriculum um, so based on this experience um, this pilot period we will then determine what you know, as any pilot period, the objective is to find out what works, mm -hmm. what doesn't work, uh, what needs to be, you know, tweaked. Um, how can we make it more effective? We'll hear, we'll get direct feedback from the teachers in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get feedback from students um, to find out, you know, what what they believe we should emphasize more, mm -hmm. uh, what perhaps doesn't make sense. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's an, an exciting period. Um, but the overall objective of, of the entire exercise, curriculum reform, is, is really transformative. It's, it's, it's really about making sure that we're producing uh, young people, we're producing students who are equipped with mm -hmm. the skills, the knowledge, um, but also the values and attitudes that we need uh, in our country for national development, mm -hmm. but also that will help them in their own personal development. Um, so I think, you know, education, I've made this point many, many times, um, you know, education is, is not a luxury. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we, especially in a country like Belize, where, you know, um, we're a developing country, we have, we're investing significant amounts of money in education, but it's limited. Mm -hmm. um, that investment has to be targeted. So education has to be tied uh, to national development goals has to be tied to economic development. Um, it has to be tied to personal development. So we have to make sure that I'm our curriculum mm -hmm. reflects, reflects that. Um, I'm glad you're saying that because <clears throat> your ministry has also recently introduced another initiative where you provided the kind of fundamental support for students, yeah. mm -hmm. particularly at the secondary school level, right. at least in Belize City, yes. where you have um, schools on the south side right. where their students are now receiving um, meals, they've gotten assistance with books, tuition and uniforms. How is that going in terms of them being able to now um, access a quality education having had exposure and access to the basics that they need? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's the, you're talking about the Education Upliftment Project, mm -hmm. Together We Rise. Um, which we launched on the south side of Belize City. Um, the GEMS, as we call them, mm -hmm. the, the GEMS, um, Gwen Lizaraga High School, Excelsior, Excelsior. High School, Maud, Maud Williams, Williams and, and Sadie Sadie Vernon. Vernon. Mm -hmm. um, and as you rightly said, um, you know, it's not just about paying tuition fees. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just about free tuition. It's also about a comprehensive, taking a comprehensive approach mm -hmm. to supporting these young people in their communities. Um, so we've provided um, digital devices, mm -hmm. uh, the feeding program, we've launched the, the, the National Healthy Start feeding program. Mm -hmm. Those schools are a part of that program. Um, uniforms, you know, um, books, um, tennis, mm -hmm. uh, all, all that sort of support where We've also worked very closely with the, um, you know, the Belize Police Department mm -hmm. to ensure that these students uh, in these communities feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, and we've said if they're where necessary, we can provide transportation. Mm -hmm. And we've also, uh, let me finish with this, also mm -hmm. say we've also tried to improve the infrastructure yeah. of these schools so that yeah. these, feel, these students feel welcomed. Uh, they feel, mm -hmm. you know, that they're going to a, a beautiful school. Uh, they feel comfortable. Um, it's welcoming to them. Um, so, you know, in all of those things, 
uh, go into to making a quality education available. When you look at the situation from a broader perspective, yeah. you will see and appreciate how intrinsically connected everything is. Right. A student can't function if he hasn't had a mm -hmm. solid meal. Mm -hmm. Right, right. A student can't function if going to school presents a challenge, right. having to navigate certain communities and neighborhoods. And when we look at um, gangs and their influence, you look at everything and you realize, you know what? You can't just pay a tuition and expect the child to be in school learning. You have to look at all the extenuating circumstances that would prevent him or her from showing up right. in the first instance yeah. and then begin to perform. Yeah. I always say, Minister, the fact that you guys have made all of this available the only thing the student has to do now show is up. to pass, show up and pass. Yeah. We've removed everything else. All the obstacles. Yeah, that will yeah. hinder you from quality education. Yeah. yeah, I think, no, the exact thought process that you mm -hmm. outlined is exactly the thought process that I and we had at the Ministry of Education, that mm -hmm. this has to be comprehensive, mm -hmm. all-encompassing. Um, but, you know, I think we also have to, to meet the challenge of, of, of the, the, the social, if you like, emotional well-being of mm -hmm. these young people. Um, because you can put all those things in place, um, but if, if they are not at a good place mm -hmm. emotionally and socially, um, you know, they have to appreciate the value of, of going to school, the value of education. What will it mean for me? Um, you know, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. Um, and I think therein lies a very serious challenge. Um, we set a modest goal because we, we knew this would be a challenging exercise. But the enrollment for all those schools, I mean, and it, it, it fell dramatically um, over the, the, the past 10 years, the, the enrollment. Very sad to report that. Um, and then, of course, COVID hit, mm -hmm. and it was even further impacted. Yeah. Um, so enrollment for all those institutions was only around 800 students for all of them combined. Wow. Um, in at the, at the before this project. Mm -hmm. So we said, listen, if we can get 200 more students into these schools, mm -hmm. um, so we set a target of 1,000 students for these four institutions. I'm happy to report to you that we are at 985. Yeah. So 15 short of so that. So 15 <laughs> short of that. <laughs> next year, um, so year they make the mark. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and it's a challenge, I can tell you, because I speak to these principals. Um, you know, s some of these students um, show up one week, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. they don't show up another week. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it may be some issue in the home. It may be some issue in the community. Mm -hmm. So it's an ongoing challenge. But I'm very, very optimistic I'm very um, you know energized by I think the, the commitment that I have seen from the schools themselves the teachers the principals um, the parents uh, they are absolutely committed to making sure that these young people uh, in these at-risk communities marginalized communities that they get an equal opportunity to have a quality education I, I mean and, and this is speaking from from just experience alone and, and putting aside the the gems uh the 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 loss of learning yeah. affected well affects everybody um in belize and nationwide um the motivation to go to school the motivation yeah. to learn and, and i think that's that was my my point when it came to the objective of the curriculum because you know you could learn something in standard five that you would need those skills equally in Farm. Right. Yeah. Um, so how how do you gauge whether or not it's working? Um, and I and I speak to that particularly in tertiary level education. Um, right. COVID um, online learning uh, placed information at the fingertips of every single student. They had Google right there telling them what to do as they're going to school. And now that you've removed that aspect from the classroom and from learning, you see that most of these students are handicapped. So how um, does the ministry hope to address this kind of attitude? I, I'm calling it an yeah. attitude. It's a, it's a whole difference in behavior. 
um, where I don't need to go to school, but if I go to school, well, at least seven days is good enough for me. Yeah. So how are we tackling that kind of attitude? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a major challenge, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a challenge I would um, say is not just a challenge for the Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a societal challenge that right. all of us have to understand and appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, you know, there are on many, many different fronts. Um, we're tackling that issue, um, working very closely with, 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 our, with our managements, um, working with the BNTU, um, working with all our stakeholders in education. There are many different exciting projects um, that we have launched um, to try to engage our young people. Um, but you're, you're right, the curriculum is at the center of, of that work. Um, how do we make that curriculum attractive? How do we make that curriculum engaging to our young students um, so that they feel that um, what, when they go to school each and every day, that they are learning something that will help to equip them uh, for life and that will help yeah, to make them, you know, better able to, to earn a living, um, to raise a family, to provide a, a good life for themselves and, and, and their family. If we're going back to the idea of reforming and strengthening the curriculum, I look at that as a giant and significant undertaking to weed out, in a manner of speaking, what doesn't work in the existing no. uh, curriculum and to introduce what we believe will work in the yeah. long run. But it's also a delicate balance in terms of localizing parts of the curriculum, right. but expanding other parts where persons can take that knowledge that they've learned in the Belizean education system and right. go outside of the country and be able to apply that. So I look at it as a very delicate thing in terms of learning about your country and learning what yeah. works in your country, but you still have to have a universal absolutely. or well-rounded perspective. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, it is a, a, a balance. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you hit the button on the, the nail uh, on the head. Um, it's about learning what matters and mm -hmm. teaching what matters. Um, but it's, it's also about making sure that, that students are equipped with, with the, as I said, the, the right skills mm -hmm. for, for life, mm -hmm. um, skills for life. So critical thinking, for example, um, you know, that will allow you to, 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 to be a global citizen. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't want to take away, f away from that. But as I, as I keep saying, we need to, to focus and target our education investment on equipping our people with the skills they need um, for contributing to their personal development, but also to the national development of Belize. Um, so competency is, is essential. That's why we focus on a competency-based curriculum, um, but also values, attitudes. So students need to learn, we hope at the end of, of their education that they learn about respect and discipline and responsibility. Uh, those critical values that will serve you well in life and help you to succeed anywhere you go, uh, whether you stay in Belize or, or you go elsewhere. Um, so it is a balance, it is a balance, um, you know, but it's all about competency-based learning, uh, learning what matters, teaching what matters. Um, and, you know, th this whole discussion, as you all will appreciate, about curriculum has been going on for for yeah. decades yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know we finally said listen we the talking has to end we have to take action mm -hmm. um, you know the curriculum is overloaded has been overloaded for for, for decades mm -hmm. um, you know it's th th there was no in my view no sense of, of purpose for the for the curriculum no clear sense mm -hmm. of purpose no clear sense of direction mm -hmm. um, focus targeted curriculum I thought was necessary um, so, some of those subjects, some of those subjects, and I'll, I'll, I'll dare say this, but again, it's my perspective, yeah. right? Weren't really consequential in the grand scheme. Yeah, yeah. You find yourself going to school, you're loaded with a barrage of different yeah, subjects, yeah. and then when you come out into the real world, right. where yeah. do you really apply it? Yeah. Right. You know, and, and that's just from 
a practical layman's point of yeah. view like i for me to go to school and right. i know this now but i didn't know it then yeah. hindsight for me to go to school or enroll into any kind of formal education system i need to know what's in it for me right because right. i as a student i'm a stakeholder mm -hmm. so if i have this mind that okay you know what i may not necessarily be academically inclined to the level that the other person is but I'm equal parts book smart and I'm equal parts good with my hands. So right. maybe I'll consider a vocational thing when I come out of school. But if there aren't any offerings that would kind of matriculate me from one to the other, then I'm stuck with either or. or yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have something where there's a smooth transition that's allowed for people who fall within a certain category. Yeah, no, no. Uh, yeah, um, you're absolutely right. The, I mean, I think we did an analysis of the what we call the learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, every subject has certain learning outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we found, at, I think at the primary school level, there were like over 10,000, mm -hmm. 10,000 learning outcomes that a yeah. student Must was expected to, mm -hmm. was expected to achieve mm -hmm. at the end of eight years. Um, and it was just, you know, a lot of ridiculous, um, <laughs> you know stuff that yeah. so I, I think we reduced that significantly mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we we took out a few thousand learning mm -hmm. outcomes out of the curriculum um, and we ended up with a much more focused targeted uh, curriculum that we believe uh, will over time because mm -hmm. as you know so any any change you make in education and investment you make in education is, is a long-term investment how you see we, the results of that how over are we years then yeah. with the introduction of stem mm -hmm. yeah. in schools because that is a new wave mm -hmm. we've seen well steam if you yes, include I have arts to put the okay arts. <laughs> yeah fair <laughs> steam if you look at where the developed countries are yeah, yeah. and you look at how they have been able to incorporate uh, steam into real world real life situations yeah. business education society politics you name it steam has a place in that yeah, yeah. but it begins from the very very small and elemental level primary school for <coughs> instance where are we with that yeah we i mean we have a long way to go um mm -hmm. like most developing countries i can tell you i was a few months ago um i chaired a meeting of ministers of education of caricom um and um, we all we spend a significant amount of time talking about the critical importance of of technology and mm -hmm. appli applying technology to education, STEAM and STEM education. Um, obviously, that's not only the future; it's the, it's the now. Mm -hmm. um, and COVID, um, you know, brought that home very clearly yeah. for all of us. Um, the critical importance of embracing technology mm -hmm. in our education system. Uh, so we understand that we recognize that our Belize Education Sector Strategy Plan 2021-2025 um, is technologically driven. Mm -hmm. it's, it's technology is at the center of that plan. Um, so we are engaging in a number of exciting initiatives. Um, you know, we, of course, science and technology is a part of our ministry. Um, so. I think we have about seven different projects that we're working on in the area of science and technology. Um, we're currently building um, a STEAM lab high school mm -hmm. on the grounds of, of the IT vet here in Belize City. Mm -hmm. um, a STEAM lab high school that was developed in collaboration um, with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. MIT yeah. um, you know, they helped to develop the, the concept note, if you like, and, and Kudos, that's design. one of the leading, that's one of the... <laughs> I, I would, they would argue they are the leading. They are the leading. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and design, you know, so they are, are working with us in a, in a consultant mm -hmm. uh, yeah. basis. Um, so that school is, is being built. We hope to have our first intake of students uh, in August, September of, September of this year. Uh, next year, sorry, it's 2023. Um, so, you know, we, we fully appreciate the, the point you're making. Um, STEM, STEAM has to be a, a critical component. We have a long way to go. Um, 
of course, uh, you know, we've seen the, the success of, of some of our private schools yes. here in Belize City, the Belize High School, so, school in particular. Yeah. They have, that's a long-term investment. We yes. people, you know, people heard about the, the recent success, um, but they've been doing that now for, well, like 15 right. years. Yes. Yes. Um, so it's a long-term investment, mm -hmm. um, developing their robotics team, um, you know, focusing on coding. We are a part, we have a code.org uh, yes. that Belize is a part of. Mm -hmm. um, we along, I think, with Barbados are, are two countries that are in that, that project. Um, so we are moving full steam ahead. Um, but, uh, you know, um, steam education, STEM education uh, requires significant investment. Mm -hmm. um, it's not cheap, um, but it's uh, absolutely necessary uh, investment I that mean, we have the, to the, make. The, um, the ambition for the, the STEAM lab is, is highly commendable, but I want to keep it on the positive note that you all have already made strides into bringing um, technological access to yeah. schools, uh, particularly with your Connect Ed yes, um, yes, initiative. Yeah. Uh, I know the last time we had um, some members of your team on the show, they were Try, they were still implementing yeah. um, Connect Ed in, in some rural areas. So can yeah. you kindly provide us with that update? Um, we're slowly running out of time, but I wanted yeah. to touch on that one. Very yeah, no, no. Quickly. Connect Ed is, is, yeah, is an exciting initiative. Mm -hmm. As you rightly said, we, we partnered with, with Digi. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we understand very clearly that, um, you know, we can't expect our students to be a part of this technological future mm -hmm. uh, if we're not equipping our schools uh, with the tools they need um, to, to have their students participate in that. So it's not just about devices. Um, you know, we've tried to, to, to work with all our partners uh, to provide devices to our young people who need them. Um, but many communities, as you all know, um, especially in our rural areas, um, have no access to electricity, electricity mm -hmm. have, ac have no access to, um, obviously, to the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that project is, is about expanding access to, to the internet, to Wi-Fi. Um, this initial phase will, will be about 200 schools. Um, and it's not just about what we found, um, you know, it was interesting. What, what we found was that in many schools where oh, people were saying, oh, this school has Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. But in many cases, it was the principal's office or the teacher's lounge that had access to Wi-Fi. So under this project, the entire campus of these schools will have access to Wi-Fi. So wherever that student is, if they're sitting on the shed, eating, having lunch, they will have access to Wi-Fi. Um, so this initial phase, as I said, is about 200 schools and we expect all of those 200 schools to have uh, full access to Wi-Fi. I think no later than, um, I would say, March of 2023. And then we can move on to another phase. At the same time, um, you know, as a government, we're looking, we're, we're working on um, bigger projects to expand internet access across the country. Um, that's not only for education, but it will be critically important for education. But obviously that's important for business and economic development purposes. Um, so, you know, very exciting as well. As you all know, Belize, uh, the Prime Minister had announced uh, either earlier this year um, that Belize had been chosen as by the Millennium Challenge Corporation mm -hmm. um, as a country for investment, um, for a grant. And the government, um, I'm very happy that the government uh, cabinet agreed that education would be the number one priority for that, mm -hmm. for that project, that MCC project. Um, so we are working along with them, the Ministry of Education. That again will see significant investments um, in education. Um, again, one of the one of the key areas is ensuring technology forms a central part of our education agenda, expanding internet access, um, providing devices. Um, so I'm very excited about that initiative. Well, Minister, a uh, final question for me. I'm not sure if Isani still has one, I'm but uh, <laughs> um, in this, it, 
it is appreciated that this government works with inter-ministries. All of you kind of connect yeah. and, and collaborate with each other. And in that regard, um, the launch of the uh, People's Commission yes, um, Committee yeah. was established last week. And um, where does decolonizing the education framework fit in that conversation? Yeah. I think it's a, it's a national priority. I think mm -hmm. it's at the top, has to be at the top of the agenda. Um, you know, I, as I said, uh, when I spoke at the launch of the PCC, mm -hmm. um, I believe this is a unique opportunity for our country, for the Belizean people, uh, to engage in a meaningful dialogue about the future governance structures of our country. Mm -hmm. And as the Minister of Education, um, I particularly want to, um, you know, reach out and challenge um, young people, um, our students in particular, um, your students at the <laughs> University of Belize um, and other students um, to, to get involved and engage in this process. Um, it's really a once in a kind of lifetime opportunity for us to make meaningful change and decolonizing the education system, the curriculum. We've already uh, our curriculum reform initiative is, has already tried to, to advance that objective. Mm -hmm. um, but this PCC structure and framework uh, provides us with a, a unique opportunity as a country, as a nation. Um, so, you know, I really, really do hope that people all across the country take it seriously. I know people are dealing with everyday, their, their everyday life mm -hmm. and their challenges. Um, but we really do have an opportunity instead of sitting at home and complaining about oh the auditor general office no work the ombudsman office no work mm -hmm. this what this these structures um the public accounts committee doesn't work we don't like how the national assembly work um argue and complain and call each other names <laughs> let's 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 have a discussion about how we can fix, fix these things mm -hmm. how we can make them work for belize and work for the Belizean people. Absolutely. Uh, Minister, yeah. thank you so much. I could continue this conversation for the rest of the day, but uh, we, we yeah. appreciate the time that you have to offer. And of course, whenever the updates come, sure. that you'll be back. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. And with that, we are going to take another break. We'll be back with uh, a coloring book that Isani does not want me to share the details on just yet. So you'll have to stick around for that conversation. <laughs>